Hi, my name's Cameron. Uh, I'm the track chair for coding and development, DrupalCon Prague, and it's my absolute honour to introduce one of the featured speakers in my track, Alex Pott. Uh, those of you who attended Dries' keynote this morning would have had a bit of an intro to Alex uh, when Dries thanked him, but for those who weren't, Alex is uh, one of only five Drupal 8 core committers, uh, and the most recently appointed, I think, in April. Um, so a core committer is someone in a very privileged position, uh, being one of the few people who can accept changes to the core of Drupal itself. Um, so for Drupal 8, we've only got Angie Byron, Nathaniel Catchpole, Jennifer Hodgson, and the docs team, Dries, of course, and Alex, who can commit code. So since April, he's already done more than 1,200 commits, which is a blistering pace. I think Dries said 50 a week this morning. Uh, and to put that in perspective, I think uh, until then there was only about 2,000 commits on the Drupal 8 trunk. Uh, so came to core development through his work on the uh, configuration management initiative, which some of you may know about, uh, which he became interested in when he was working as lead developer on the Royal Mail project. Uh, talked to Greg Dunlop, became part of that initiative, and then was invited by Dries to be a core committer. He's now working full time uh, in London on Drupal 8, and he's an absolutely lovely guy. It's really my honor to, to introduce him. So the theme of the conference is one to many. Alex is gonna talk about how Drupal 8 has incorporated uh, in ideas, technologies, and indeed libraries from the wider PHP community, and what that means for Drupal now and in the future. So Alex, take it away. Thank you, Cameron. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Cameron has just said, I'm here to talk about the Drupal 8 story, how we've gone from not invented here to proudly found elsewhere. And we're looking for ideas from outside of the Drupal community, outside of PHP, on how to make Drupal better. So that's who I am. He's introduced me, so that slide is rather redundant. Um, so we'll move on to who are you. I'm hoping that most of you are Drupal developers who are new to Drupal 8, and that I'm going to talk to you about why we're making the changes that we've made to Drupal 8, how to talk in Drupal 8 so that when you come to issues and you, you look at the way that the code's written, you understand what it's, what it's trying to do. I'm going to talk about some of the advantages about the changes that we've made from a developer perspective. So in order to talk about why we've made the changes to Drupal 8, we have to go back in time. So I don't know how many of you know how Drupal started, but Drupal was started in a dorm at a university by user one sitting there going, hey, I want to make a slash dot for my dorm. And so that's what he set out to do. He made, made the, the drop.org, and him and his friends posted messages and started to share the software. This has impacts on the way that Drupal is written. And the, the way that the internet was in 1999 also has impacts. You know, Google was in beta, everyone was using Internet Explorer 5. There were some advanced things going on on the internet, like SETI at home, but it was all like bespoke software. And the internet was full of tables, and it, it just was a different world. And people were using these to access the internet and these to make phone calls. We're not in that world anymore. So looking at what we have today, we have a Drupal that's sitting at the heart of the internet, getting requests from iPhones, from kiosk applications, from desktops, of course, from all sorts of other frameworks and systems. Yet at the moment, Drupal 7 assumes the moment it's making a response to a request that it's this desktop. That's what it does. And in Drupal 7, in order to get around this, the services module does all sorts of evil things like just exiting straight from code. So any, anything you've got that, that's going to fire at the end of a response on termination, there, that won't fire. But yep, that's Drupal 7 for HTML. So at the beginning of the cycle for Drupal 8, Larry Garfield said that Drupal basically needs to evolve and quickly from the first class web CMS into a first class REST server that includes the first class web CMS. And this has a fundamental impact on the way in which we have to architect Drupal to work. And so I'm going to talk about what that is. At the same time, the tools on which we've built Drupal 
have been changing. So PHP is no longer PHP 4 that it was back in 1999. It's embraced concepts and techniques such as OO, namespaces, and uh, anonymous functions that we need to embrace because that's, that's PHP. That's the fundamental language that we're using. So Drupal 8 is object-orientated because PHP is object-oriented. So if you, if you don't get classes, objects, and interfaces, then now's the time to start to learn. So I'm going to show you why that's important in quite simple numbers. Drupal 7 has 380 classes. Basically, it's all the DB layer. Drupal 8, at the moment, has 2,816 classes, and it's only going to grow. So if you want to develop on Drupal 8, Getting comfortable with OO code is, is going to be mandatory. So one of the key things that was introduced in PHP 5.3, which Drupal 8 assumed is the lowest version that the Drupal 8 is going to work on, is namespaces. And what namespaces allow us to do is to use classes with the same name, like database, but take them from different places. <coughs> So with PHP 5.3 and its new object orientation and namespaces, people were sitting around saying, well, actually, this now allows us to share code between our, our projects. And so in 2009, some people came together under the Framework Inter Interoperability Group, so-called PHP Fig, and proposed PSR 0, which is a way in which projects can share their classes and share, their ob share objects and share functionality so that we don't all have to do the same thing. Which basically says that if we're going to have an object, we're going to namespace it like this. We're going to have a vendor name, Drupal, a namespace, um, database, and a class name, connection, for example. And so what this allows us to do in code is to use our objects like this. So at the top of our code, we write use Drupal user entity role. And then I, in my code, I can create a, create a new role just by going new role. And then automatic, automatically, PHP will be able to include the role file in your, in your directory structure, which at the moment is buried quite deep because it's PSR 0. Um, and it will load this file automatically for you when it, when it needs the class. So we have auto-loading and we have namespaces, but the next bit that, that, that really meant that PHP projects could start to share code was the advent of Composer. Uh, I skipped. And what this is, is it's a, a dependency management tool for projects. So it allows us to say that my Drupal project needs code from Symfony, it needs code from Zend, or any framework or any part of PHP that we want, we can pull in in a, in a, in a way that allows the autoloader to load those classes for us. So at the moment, Drupal 8 is relying on 11 or so Symfony components. But it's not just Symfony, as I was saying. We're using Doctrine for parsing annotations. We're using Easy RDF for managing our RDF stuff. We're using Guzzle for making HTTP requests. We're using the Zen framework to manage RSS aggregation. And we're using Twig for templating. So we're pulling in all this extra code to handle problems that we don't need to solve, problems that other people have solved for us. So now, with Vendor, we actually have over 5,000 objects in Drupal 8 that you can instantiate and use to solve your problems. So we have all these new objects, and we have this, the, the, the new PHP ecosystem built around object orientation, namespaces, and autoloading. But that means that we now need to use some new words to talk about the way that Drupal 8 works. And I think it's, language is a really important thing. If we use different words to talk about the same things, then we end up with confusion. And I think that we need to use 
a model-based language, a, a language that, where the words are, represent things that we can all think about and sh share, share an understanding in, so that we can come together and create a great Drupal 8 and great websites and products built off it. So I'm going to go through some of the words that you'll hear a lot in Drupal 8 and then show you the code that creates these things. So services. What services are are basically global objects that provide functionality to your code. So a classic service would be something like a cache backend, the mailer, or the module handler, which will allow you to not care about how it does it, but just get the database connection, install a module. You can go uh, create, uh, I have the module handler, just install. And services have to live somewhere in Drupal 8. And so services live on the container. And so the container is the collection of all of the global objects that you can access. And the advantage of using a container, and specifically the Symfony container, is that it means that we can inject the dependencies into the services. And what that allows us to do is to remove the assumptions that your code is making about what it needs. <coughs> so it allows us to remove all of the hard-coded dependencies and then it makes it possible to change them. So if we want to swap out the HTTP client that's currently in core, we can. And then your code, just because it is having the HTTP client injected, can just use the new one because you know that it's going to implement the same interface. And this allows us to write clutter-free and testable code because the less your code actually knows about the rest of the application, the more reusable it is by others and by yourself. So in Drupal 8, to set up a service, all we do is we declare stuff in our, well, we can declare stuff in core.services.yaml, which is basically, this is saying, okay, I've got my config factory service. It's going to instantiate this class, and it's going to have the, the storage and the context injected in, which are other services. Here's the database service. It gets the connect, it creates a connection, and in order to create that connection, it uses a factory. And the arguments are the default settings. These are the default settings from your, your, your settings.php. <coughs> you don't have to just use YAML to register services. You can programmatically register them in PHP. And what this allows us to do is to swap things out at different times. So in, when we're installing Drupal, the module handler isn't the cached module handler, but when it's in runtime, we're using the cached module handler. So it's really flexible in, in the way that we can now change things at different states. And what this, the, the impact of this is, is amazing in terms of what we can do with now the upgrade path, the updater. The updater has a completely alternate module handler that prevents you from firing hooks. So we've, we've told you in Drupal 5 and 6 and 7, don't fire hooks from your upgrade path. It's actually now impossible to fire hooks from the upgrade path. And this is a big win because it means that we won't break Drupal in the ways that we've broken it before. It's more robust. You're going to hear a lot about requests and responses. These are, these are symphony objects that we've used to model the way in which Drupal works. So a request is made, and a response is returned to the browser. When a request is made, we discover a route, if you're American, or route, if you're English. And the route will declare what controller to use in order to create the response. And again, the, the routes are declared in YAML. So here is the user autocomplete route, so slash user autocomplete. Here's the controller to use. And here's what permission it requires. It's declarative. This is the equivalent of the routing part of hook menu in Drupal 7. And here is the controller. And here, here we see dependency injection in action. We, we inject the user autocomplete service into, the, into the, the controller. And then the controller just calls get matches. So that means in order to test 
the user autocomplete service, which is that there is the declaration in the services YAML file, we actually don't need a request, or we can mock the request. So our, our, our auto-completion for, for <coughs> users is now divorced from our request handling. In Drupal 7, in order to test this code, you would have needed to fire up a web browser. Now we don't. Now this is testable in other ways. You're going to hear a lot about plugins. And all plugins are is a group of similar objects that can be used in a part of Drupal. So a good example is blocks. So not every block does the same thing, but when you place a block on a page, it provides a view. A view as in, as in uh, some HTML to put on the page. And the, the thing that's special about plugins is that they are discovered. So we have discovery mechanisms. And what discovery mechanisms in, in Drupal 7 basically replace is all of the hook something info. So hook entity info, hook field formatter info, hook field widget info, hook image toolkits, they're all gone in favor of a common discovery method. Or we have two at the moment. And one of them is annotations, which we've borrowed from doctrine. So I'm going to show you some of an annotation. I'm going to show you a block and try and show you why this is really, really nice. So in Drupal 7, we have our system block view and at the moment, I, if, as a developer, I'm wanting to work on um, the powered by block. I have to read all this code. It's going into a switch. And I'm going, oh, yeah, that's great. There's my theme. Drupal 8, we don't need the, that view hook, the, the, the hook view. We don't need the hook block info. All we have is the annotation in the same place as we're telling it how to render the, the block. So we have an app plugin. Here's the ID that appears in the um, admin interface, and here's the function that just returns the theme block. And so in order to create a block, you can just copy this file, change the ID, the admin label, do what you want on the output, and then it, the system will automatically discover it for you. Another big change in Drupal 8 is entities. And basically, everything is an entity that has a life cycle that can be created changed over its life, and then deleted at some point, or kept around. And, and the important thing about an entity is that it's uniquely identifiable. So we have content entities, which are pretty similar to Drupal 7. There's obviously nodes, users, comments, but we've also now got contact messages um, <coughs> and menu items. But we also have configuration entities, like views, vocabularies, contact categories, fields, menus and roles. And what's, what's nice about configuration entities is that they use the CMI system in order to be managed. So we have the user authenticated role looking like this. So it's really easy to read this file and see what permissions it has. And we can copy that file up to production into a staging directory, import it, and make the changes. But what's also nice about using the entity system to manage things like roles is that we can then put helpful methods on the role entity. So we can implement has permission. So you create your role, or you load up the role, the, 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 the authenticated role, and you ask it, does it have a permission? And this actually helps us fix bugs. At the moment, this, this code reads like um, the, the code for should I search comments, depending on whether the authenticated or anonymous user has access to comments, now looks like this. And it's, it's, it's much easier to read. I can go, OK, this role, does it have this permission? Has the permission access comments? Yeah, and if the role IDs are this, yeah, OK, I can't, I can't index comments because the, an, the authenticated user doesn't have access to comments, but the anonymous does or something like that. In Drupal 7, the code was like this. We just we queried straight out of the database, and we made uh, we we loaded up a huge array. We went, okay, the array key is going to be the permission name, and and then we're going to see if the role ID has it. And when we moved to Drupal 8, we changed what these constants were, and we we ended up introducing a bug that if you created a role like administrator that was less than authenticated user, it would actually fall in here. You'd never be able to index your comments. 
So by having interfaces which declare helpful methods on your entities, we're able to actually make the code more readable and easier to debug. So everything is different in Drupal 8. But that also is getting us some other wins. A lot of people say that Drupal 8 is more complicated. But I'm going to make an argument that it's actually less, less complexity. I've shown you that the, the blocks are less complex. I've shown that it's possible with config entities to manage configuration in a less complex way. But I also think it's measurably less complex. So if we have a look at how we can measure complexity, there's, there's, a, there's a measure in computing called cyclomatic complexity, which basically just measures the numbers of decision points in code. So this function here has four decision points. The decision to call the function and each, each if or else if. So if we have a look at what that would mean for a function, one to four cyclomatic complexity is low complexity. That didn't look very complex. Five to seven, moderate complexity. 8 to 10, high complexity, more than 11, it's just very, very complex. If we have a look at, we can, but we can move this measure to actually every line of code in a project. And so generally, there's been some studies, and it shows that you know, here, here are the, the, the kind of measures that we would look for. So you know, Drupal's not going to be a, a low complex applica application, never has been. Um, but it'd be nice if we were in the moderate complexity uh, range. So if we have a look at Drupal 6, actually Drupal 6 was, was, was very complex. Like Lots of functions did an awful lot. They had lots and lots of features and, and uh, abilities to do, to, to do different things. And so when you were trying to work out what does that function do, you had to read a lot of code. And you, you weren't always sure what it was going to do. Drupal 7, we got better. We, we, we got a lot better. Um, and now in Drupal 8, we're actually in the sweet spot of, of measurable complexity where you're looking at most functions, they're, they're just doing a single thing, they're not doing lots and lots of different things. But actually, you know, what you would say here is the number of lines of code has gone up by 300,000. So what does this really mean? We've actually got a lot more decision points. And what's really, really interesting, is, and you couldn't make this up, is that Drupal 6 is actually 77% less complex in this measure of numbers of decisions than Drupal 7. And Drupal 8 is 77% more complex than Drupal 7. So am I losing my argument? Well, maybe not. Because actually, if I take Drupal 7 and I remove the modules that have been removed, like blog, dashboard, open ID, poll, profile, PHP, but I add in views, email, link, telephone, features, entity, entity reference, C tools, and WYSIWYG, which is just a selection of some of the functionality that you would have to bring into core to have the same feature set as Drupal 8. We actually get to a point where the number of decision points is more in Drupal 7. So I think that in order to achieve Drupal 8's functionality in Drupal 7, you're going to have a, a more complex site. And so just to kind of like really focus in on one of the changes that we made in Drupal 8 and how we've benefited from going and using other libraries, we can have a look at this function, Drupal HTTP request, which is really hard to change. It has a cyclomatic complexity of 41, which is, oh yeah, it's over that 10 measure. But also, there was an issue that was started in 2004. It took 12 years and over 400 comments to actually get a commit into Drupal 8. It was fixed for Drupal 8. But we now, we don't even have the function in Drupal 8. We just use Guzzle. And what's, and what's amazing is that in order to actually test that code ourselves, we would actually have to write 25 billion tests to actually fully test. Drupal H2 request. It's, it's, it's not possible. And what's even more funny is that that issue is now broken. We can't actually, we can't actually use proxies in core. But in order to use proxies in core, we actually only require this code. So we, we can actually take the Guzzle HP client, modify it, just add the proxy 
settings, whatever we want, straight on there. And because we're using dependency injection everywhere to inject the, the HTTP client into every service that needs it, we just benefit. So issues that took 12 years of arguing can be solved in five lines of code in Drupal 8. I think that's pretty cool. Another thing that we've done is we brought in PHP unit. And so we finally have a way of testing our, our, our code in ways that doesn't rely on, on the simple test browser. And what's really good about that is that we're testing all of our code and all of our functionality on a browser that no one ever uses. It doesn't really make sense. And we're, we're trying to make it test things that it, we don't need to have all of that. We do, we, we're not isolating what we're, what we're actually testing. And it's slow. So PHP unit, to actually run all the tests at the moment, takes four seconds to make nearly 2,000 assertions. Simple test takes an hour and a half on the test bots to make 50,000 assertions. So it's, it's, it's a big improvement. If we can move much more of our, our testing to PHP unit, we're going to benefit. And we're going to benefit in other ways, because it's not just about speed. We get more information back on what we're testing. So it's possible in, in PHP unit to produce coverage reports. So here's the date time plus class. And I know that we've got all of these, these methods in there. And I know that this method, 80% of the lines are being hit by my test. So I can actually look and say, hey, we're missing test coverage for this format class because there's only 33% of the lines actually tested. It's brilliant. And it, it's really lovely because you actually can get the code and I can say that in the test for create from array, we've got nothing that's testing that we throw this exception correctly because that line is red and all the other lines are green so they're being hit by my test. So I've spent a lot of time talking about what we've brought in from PHP, but it's not just about PHP, what Drupal 8 has changed. You heard this morning what, what Dries was talking about. We have um, six new front-end libraries in core. We've got uh, CK Editor, Backbone, Modernizer, which wasn't mentioned. And we've got massive efforts to, 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 to clean up front-end performance. Like one of my favorite facts about Drupal 8, which is not PHP related, is that in order to do a request in Drupal 7, just install and re uh, request a node, you'll actually make 24 requests for different assets. In Drupal 8, that's now only 13. It's a lot of work that people have done on that. So if I wanted to know more about some of the things that I've been talking about, I can't recommend phptherightway.com enough to have a look at how PHP has changed in the past three or four years to embrace object orientation, and new design patterns. Um, if you want to see about how to create a framework like the way that Drupal 8 has, has used Symfony, then FabPot Framework will bring up an amazing series of tutorials on using Symfony components. And talking about the way that we use language, it, Eric Evans' Domain Driven Design is, is, a, is a great book. So <laughs> also, now I'm on stage. I would like to thank everyone who's contributed to my Git tip, because I don't know how many of you actually know about how I'm funded and, and only work on Drupal 8, but it's my own money and contributions from the community. So thank you, everyone, for, for, for giving me money. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's just cool. <laughs> Last but not least, Come to the sprints on Friday. We need more help. There's lots to do in Drupal 8. There's going to be, there's going to be big decisions made, and we're going to produce an amazing project, and I would really, really like you all to be a part of it. So yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Any questions? Yay. So Elliot's just asked me, what do you think the biggest remaining challenges are to tackle with Drupal 8? Well, from my perspective, it's, it's finishing CMI. I really want to see that, that finished. Um, I think that there are challenges around the upgrade path. Um, 
making sure that it works in, 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 in all situations. We've, we've done a lot to improve the testing on upgrade paths, but uh, you know, th there's, there's always more work to, to be done because most people don't have a Drupal 7 site that's just Drupal 7 core. They've got contrib modules, they've got, they've got everything there. So we've got to, it's, it's really unknown what you're upgrading from, so, so we have to do work. So I think those are the two big challenges for me personally. But for Drupal as a whole, I think, you know, in, in, in the Dries note this morning, you know, he laid out that, that we have um, challenges around complexity and, and DX, and we really, really want to improve that as well. Angie. So Angie asked me what, what, what things get me the most excited, me, me the most excited. I think, I think for me the, the, the most exciting thing is the consistency in handling different things that are, are similar within, within the Drupal universe. So, so how we handle role configuration and how we handle um, uh, views and the, 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 the methods are the same. So if I want to know what's the UUID of a view, I call the UUID method if I want to know what the UUID of the role is because they're both config entities. They have the same methods. And, th and this is nice because if you're hand it's, uh, that perhaps my answer is a little bit more obtuse than it needs to be because if you look at nodes and users, in, in, in order to get their ID in Drupal 7 land, you go node arrow UID for the user, uh, node arrow NID for the, for the node and user arrow UID for the for the, for the user, but in, in Drupal 8, you just call the ID method and it will return you the ID. You have to know less. You, you, and and there, if you have a, an IDE that auto-completes, it will tell you that that ID method is there. So once you know it, you, once you've learned it for nodes, you know it for users, you know it for actually views, you know it for everything. So I think that there's a consistency there that, that we, we haven't had before. So, so the question um, is, Drupal versions prior to Drupal 8 were largely procedural, and Drupal versions, um, Drupal 8 and the future might be largely OO. Um, well, I can, I, I can only answer for myself and how I came into Drupal, which was um, as a site builder. Um, I was building sites for a university. Um, I wanted a tool that, that, that I could click together stuff. I, I didn't know the, comparison of different things, and I was like, oh, Drupal looks good. At that point, I had not looked at the code. I didn't know whether it was procedural or oh, I didn't care. What I cared is that, uh, is that I had this um, amazing ability to create content types, list them, and, and click it together in a way that just worked, and it was solving my problems. Um, then I got to this point where I was like, oh, it's not solving my problems anymore. I need to, I need to change something. And then I just I was like, oh, this is procedural code. Okay, that's that's fine. If but I don't think that that changes. You know, if you're a, if you're a site builder and you, you get into coding and it's now oh, you're not going to sit there and go, oh, I wish it was procedural. You're going to say, okay, this is the paradigm. So I'm not I'm not sure that it changes that much. So the, so the question is, is um, do I think that other projects will, will, will join to use Drupal components? Um, and yeah, if we get it right, if we provide valuable things back to the PHP community, sure. Um, and in fact, in the last month or so, the, the Drupal 8 initiative lead for Blocks has been doing a lot of work on plugins in Symfony, and he's been talking a lot in the Symfony uh, channels, and they're very interested in our plugin system because they don't have an equivalent system. So, so yeah, I, I, I think that if we don't give code back to the wider PHP community, we've kind of failed. It's not a one-way street. Any more? Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>